Hi guys, my name is Tatiana, Tango Dancers channel, and today we have the first interview with a very nice guest. She has various experience, including dancing, tango organizing, performing, DJing, and also has a special project which she's going to tell about. And today's guest is Christina Ivanova, one of my friends and colleagues uh, who lives in the United States currently, and she's going to tell you about her story with tango and will talk about different sides of tango as well as her experience throughout many years of tango journey. So how did you start dancing tango and um, where was it? Hi Tatiana, hi everyone. I started my tango journey in my hometown in Moscow, Russia about 17 years ago. I might be mistaken but I was about 20 years old, so that's that's I remember. And my I was training at that time uh, in a ballroom dancing in a Latin program and one day our teacher put got on project music and started to do some funny steps that he called it Argentine tango and I, I felt that it has nothing to do with ballroom itself and it's probably a different type of dance so I went into the internet to search and so I've learned that yes, Argentine tango is a it's a dance on its own, um, and there are plenty of tango schools in Moscow. And I was curious to know more, and I joined I joined one of the school, and it was back in two thousand six, two thousand five, something like that. Okay, so so it's like roughly like about fifteen years ago, right? So yes, okay. yes. 14, I guess, <laughs> um, the math skills. Yeah, I guess yeah, the, the numbers is just like, now I'm losing track of that. <laughs> yeah, after 10 years, I think the, it kind of gets a bit more blurred, like the amount of years. So. Yes, now I can only realize, so like 10 years ago, I, I moved to the States, and but I've already been dancing tango, but for, for how many years before, it's all a, a little bit blurry, yeah. So when you started dancing tango in Moscow, and actually I started as well just a couple of years earlier than you, so how was this scene for you? Like, how did it feel when you first joined uh, classes and also any longer? Uh, I loved it. Um, I was pretty young, so I didn't have any, any expectations, and I, will, uh, I have been dancing for pretty much all my life. So I, I joined the dance scene, the tango, as, as, as a dancer. And my memories of tango community at that time were very, very sweet. We had um, a wonderful group of people um, at our school, which is Go Tango. Slava Ivanov is my teacher, my very, very first teacher. Yes, we all know Yeah, him. I learned also from them some and, Yes, yes, excellent. And at that time, he was teaching with Olga. And so I loved them as a teachers. We were lucky to have, I, in my opinion, the best group ever. Many talented people were in that group. And then I know that some, some people from that particular group has become teachers later on, including myself. So it was a wonderful one year of being in that studio, in that school. And at that time, I didn't go much out to Milongas because the, the classes itself and the practice with people from the class outside of the studio were sufficient. So uh, once in a while I would go to Milongas, but I also was young, so it's like um, a little bit scary. And but overall, my my memory of Moscow community is very sweet and warm. Give, gives me warm yeah. feelings. So how long did it take you to actually get to a Milonga? Did you go? early or later and how was it for you um our teacher would organize a group um, group outings to milonga so when we would go as a group together and that's how we started to go about half a year after our first class i believe 
Oh, that's great. So you already had six kilos, right? Because I think... Overall experience, yes. And then we would go and mostly we would go dance with each other uh, and with our teacher. And then uh, we would go on our own to the milonga that we like and then uh, us being a beginner sit <laughs> most of the time <laughs> rather than dancing <laughs> but just sitting in a place <laughs> observing people dancing watching carefully what they do is is a, is a gift in itself so because you learn a lot just by sitting and watching dancers dance as far as i understood uh you learned sort of like in a more continuous uh good way in terms of like you didn't uh, go from one teacher to another a lot it's so, so no. you really had a fundamental base and then it yes in the class there are always people who got very serious about tango like from the first class they they feel that they like the dance and they want to continue they want to progress they want to practice more and more and obviously for tango you need a partner you don't dance it by yourself so and then you find like-minded people and you just connect and yes you go together you practice outside of the studio so you watch videos together you um, listen music together and maybe you try other teachers as well so that was our case we tried but then we come we came back to um, to go tango studio and and we stayed and and after that i haven't tried changing anything i just stayed with slava until I left to United Kingdom. Yes, yes, United Kingdom. So before US, I was living one year in the United Kingdom in Bel oh, really? in oh. um, uh, Birmingham. Yes, oh, Birmingham. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah. And then, yes, I had I joined another studio. So I stayed there for one year, continuing studying tango, but it was very different style, more of traditional style salon style that is called now and also i was very blessed to have wonderful teachers there and so because of that because i had constant uninterrupted experience of taking classes for one year with one teacher for another year with another teacher i did not jump all, all over mm -hmm. the place mm -hmm. yes so it gave me very very good solid foundation and tango after help me to become a good dancer it actually probably helps as a teacher as well right to see how people teach in a more uh, like for different levels right so when since you kind of followed teachers for a yes. more longer term yeah yes. absolutely it also helps to under as a teacher to understand that all of the um, different varieties of styles tango but they're not that different. So the fundamentals are still the same. Tango is tango. Then we have a style of appearance, how we want to look, like more traditional, more of the nuevo or more for milonguero. That's all of the outlook, what we personally prefer, what music we prefer to dance, yes. But the fundamentals are the same in tango for everything and so mm -hmm. it's very important to stay with one teacher just trust the teacher and trust the process for one year i see my experience as being a teacher i see people going also to 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 different studios to different places which is okay but it confuses at the beginning it confuses because tango has no so uh, has no um guidebook right has no um like textbook that's that's the textbook so we all follow as there is no bible no, and yeah. right so as a teachers we come and teach from our own experience how we understand tango how we have developed what, how we developed in tango and how we through teaching experience we know what's the best way to to give the information to the student at what time what he needs to know or she needs to know now what she is going to know in a week in two weeks so it's, it's a process and to become a teacher is also a process and the students needs to they they have to trust the teacher and stay with one teacher for 
some period of time until they decide whether they want to change it or not. But otherwise, yeah. it's like it's a big confusion. Yeah. In terms of styles, for example, like compared to when you started in Moscow and where you are now, like did it change through through the time? And in general, like how do you do you distinguish different styles in tango? For example, I personally realize it just really depends on with whom you are dancing. And uh, uh, so, what's your take on that? Do you do you prefer a specific style, or how does it usually go? Yes, for the follower, for the woman, it depends with who we dance. And yes, although now it's a worldwide is a big discussion about styles that actually uh, styles of tango that mm, they exist or not, they don't exist. In my opinion, in my personal opinion, it's not the style per se that exists, but still there are some differences, right? Um, there is a milonguero, there is a salon. And if we see, if we watch video of someone uh, famous in milonguero, and then we see a video of a salon, we, we do with our eyes, we, we do see differences in move patterns that they use in the music and the clothes they, they choose to dance. Um, or if we refer to what it was Nuevo style and go back to 90s, 95th, 1995 year, yes, or 2000, or 2005, those years, and and what we see now in with all the competitions, that all, all the grown tango salon competitions around the world in Europe and everything, yes. So and and then if they put the tango in a competition now. They need to judge somehow. So there's certain probably rules that what it is tango salon, what we are looking at. So then, yes, we are talking about styles. It seems like it goes in cycles, like fashion in a way, right? It's just that the history of tango is not as long as fashion history, right? So, but it just, right. it's in waves, right? So maybe even some countries, in my opinion, it's from my experience, it comes earlier or later to a certain country like what's going on in the world right so because for example when i started yes. we used to watch a lot of tango nuevo videos and that's what i like personally a lot like uh, and then uh, close embrace jumped in more and then how was your experience actually when you started at that time was it mostly close embrace or open or, or mixed yes my personal experience was very interesting because well in moscow was my first first year and we were beginners so my teacher gave a very solid base right that was not uh, that was in close embrace yes he was teaching in close embrace mostly using Tango Nuevo music for the classes, because it also for to to keep beginners in the group, you need to have some music that excites you, right? Uh, not always traditional music excites beginners. That I also have experience. So for my beginners, I put some Tango Nuevo so they get it. <laughs> so it was for some embrace, but for Tango Nuevo music, and. I DJ a little bit and I have a very good collection of Tango Nuevo music that is from that epoch, from Moscow, from my first years in Tango. So, but that in, after that in England, I was purely, purely in what it's now called Tango Salon. My teacher was a, a, a student and a very good friend of a very famous teacher in tango salon style that is pure pure tango salon so i have experienced that and i love it it was close embrace never open and very traditional stylish elegant um way of dancing tango so i i had i had a mix of both but it gave me also good understanding then yes there are people who preserve try to preserve a certain way of dancing. Personally, I love dancing in close embrace and I'm a close embrace person. What it is, Milonguero, Salon, I don't know. When I visit Buenos Aires and dance in the, at the Milongas, people call me Milonguera, which is refers to, to 
to the <laughs> to lady who comes and dance at the milongas but the um once in a while I ask, well, what do you exactly mean? And they say, well, you are dancing in Milongero style. So mm -hmm. I don't know. In, in mm -hmm. stars, uh, they see me and feel me uh, feel me as uh, I'm in a Milongero style. I don't say that, but yes, I dance in close and base. For my students, I teach them in open. Beginners, you can't teach and yeah. you, you can't start right away in closing bases. Yes, impossible. I totally agree. It's just also my experience. So in terms of music, for example, um, how long did it take you to actually really feel and like uh, traditional music? I know that in at those years, we played quite a bit of tango, alternative tango at some places in Moscow. And I don't know how it was when you started, but uh, if cortinas were not even as present, right? Sometimes they would play like a few songs in a row as in Europe. Mm -hmm. so, so now it's probably much more defined, uh, three or four songs per tanda, yeah. Yes. So uh, it took me about half a year or even a year to start enjoying traditional tango in the form of Pugliese. So, <laughs> because Pugliese <laughs> has all the drama. <laughs> you can see yes. a future performer yes. in the... <laughs> Yes. So my first year, Tango Nuevo, whatever, Carlos, Carlos Lidizinski, Otros Aires, Gotan Project, all of those guys, yes. Then it was Color Tango that I actually came to Moscow. I think about the, the, the year that I was also in Moscow. And uh, then Pugliese, Pugliese came in, the, uh, in England with my... Uh, salon teachers, yes, salon style teachers. So they would play a lot of Pugliese and I, I started to like it, actually love it for all the drama that it has. And then all others came much, much later. Just at home I would listen Tango Noel and Pugliese. At the Milongas we listen what the DJ plays, yes, but much later I started to enjoy traditional tango. Mm -hmm. What actually brought you to England, by the way, I wanted to ask, like, was it, uh, because I know that for Russians, it's not that easy to go and just leave in, in another country, yeah. whoever is listening, if you're not familiar with that. So Russians usually, especially in 10 years ago, 15 years ago, we would need visa to go to everywhere to justify every day. So yes. uh, it wasn't as easy to travel, actually, for, for tango. It was a bit of a struggle, but it was worth it. <laughs> yes. So, I had a student visa for England and I, uh, I went there to study English for no reason. It just happened. It was the opportunity for me, the opportunity opened to go and study English in a college for one year and, then, and I went. It was right after I finished my university in Moscow. Yeah, and it definitely mm -hmm. probably helped in the U.S. later yeah. with the language, right? And, yeah. Okay, so when you moved from Moscow to uh, U.S., like, how was the, in terms of community, like, did you felt yourself at home right away, or it took a while to, to have that switch, or, I mean, well, tango, community. tango community, yes, at home, right away, that, that is one of the gifts of tango that tango has is that whenever you travel you open the door you hear the music yes tango music and you feel you are at home yes. and nothing else is important so you know that you dance tango and so you can communicate to other people it's like you speak the language and and you know that tango is in you inside of you so you are part of it and you feel connected right away Mm -hmm. Nice. So you wouldn't even tell that the uh, structural differences or the like, cultural were as uh, noticeable, right? Like when you... There were, there were uh, cultural and structural and social differences, how the Milongas go in Russia, how Milongas go in Seattle in particular. Yes, same for the whole United States. I don't know much, only in Seattle area. So... The differences were, and the differences were huge. Uh, for example, in Seattle, most of the milongas happening in the dance studios or in a small restaurants that are not so fancy. You know, it's just like um, a regular 
normal place, not, nothing special about it. In Moscow, we know that most of the milongas happening outside in a bar, in a restaurant. So it's a, it's a social place where not only dancers come, but also people from the streets may come in. Yes. And it's all, it's like in Buenos Aires, you go out, it's, it's going out. So you dress appropriately, you prepare, right. In Seattle, it's more relaxed. So especially if it's in a dance studio, so people just come and it turns out to be more like a practica rather than a milonga. That was the big difference that I noticed right away. It's like, wow, what a milonga, <laughs> more like a practica. <laughs> Did you like it actually? Or it was like you missed that like more bohemian feel of Moscow? <laughs> I didn't say I like it or not. I was just surprised and I accepted it for what it is. And yeah. I, I just missed Moscow. I was like, well, yeah, in Moscow is a little bit different. Moscow. I have something to say, but I'll keep it for another <laughs> interview. <Yeah. laughs> in terms of Vancouver, because they're so close. It's really nice that this city is so close, right? Yeah. So now let's talk a little bit about your uh, performing experience, because I know that you, did you start to perform quite fast or it took you a lot of years? How was it? Uh, it took me pretty fast. <laughs> so I, I started to perform in Moscow as well, because uh, so the story is after I came back from England, I met my dance partner with who we opened a uh, school in Moscow. Oh, okay. Yes. So my first school was actually in Moscow. And with, with him, we would perform a couple of times. We were actually even filmed at some TV show. As oh. I remember now, some, um, the, the photos of the magician, of one of the famous uh, magician, I don't remember the name, in, 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 Rus in Russia. So, yes, we started back in Moscow with so my how was, first Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. so, so um, how long have you danced at that time? And by that time, I had two years of experience but solid experience okay, yes okay. very solid experience mm -hmm. nice yeah i didn't plus, actually i didn't know that you had a school so it's great to know yes, yes. yes. plus what helped me is that i was um, i danced before so when i entered tango i i had a dance experience i had a dance background so it's not like it's something out of nowhere since you started performing fairly fast, like, have you had any dance experience before? Like, what kind of, when did you start dancing? Yes, I started as probably many, many kids from ballroom in, at six years old. But, and I spent there for um, one year. Uh, but I didn't have partner, so obviously it always comes to the having a dance partner. So there were not enough boys in the group and somehow... Um, no arrangements were made, so I just didn't have a partner and I gave up on that. Then my grandma enrolled me in a, in a female team, so it's just kind of girls in the choreography group. It's a contemporary, contemporary dance, type of dance that we had experience in a classical ballet as a preparation just to to build up the the body positions all of that and then our choreographer would just came up with it with a choreography piece dance piece and she she had many kids many groups and once a year she would put out the performance on the stage so all the parents and friends could see yes so that's how i um, I was dancing yeah. and performing in a yeah. type of dance, which is called like just contemporary, contemporary style. So who were your inspiration at that time when you started and did it, how did it change for years? In Argentine tango? In Argentine tango, yeah. My inspiration. So when I started, uh, my inspiration was certainly my teachers, uh, Slava and Olga. So they, they had such a magical connection between each other. And uh, I, I remember the feel we had a very small space where we 
had the classes and the group was pretty huge in that tiny space i remember when i first saw the place i was like how can we even dance here and the floor wasn't the hollywood it was something linoleum or something like that but then when slava came in and started to give the class the space has transformed it's like it's open and i was like i feel like there is enough space the floor is perfect everything is great so <laughs> there go my mind inspiration and then in england my other teachers lloyd and sandra lloyd vidal and sandra vidal uh husband and wife so they inspired me as well for the purity of style that they they were a haven yes and 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 later when i already started to watch videos because honestly to say i was not watching youtube or any anything oh really <laughs> anything on, on oh. yes for about three years or so when when i started tango i wasn't it's just when when we would come with a dance partner to to practice my dance partner would show me oh look at that look at that let's let's do that step let's do that let's and i said okay 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 so just like it was, it was always coming from the dance partner and only three years after four years after of already being in tango i myself started to watch videos and i started to develop a sense of yes what i personally like more and I remember I at that time I loved watching Geraldine Rojas and Javier Rodriguez, uh, them, and then Javier with Andrea, and then Sebastian Arce with Mariana Montes. So those two couples um, like what were my inspiration at that time. Mm -hmm. Yes, at that time we are talking 10 years ago. And and later, I don't remember, just whatever comes on YouTube or Facebook, occasionally you watch. Uh, nowadays, I don't have any strong preferences on, on anyone. I enjoy watching all, all couples and they certainly they each each of them have value, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> so and, for those who are not yet tango dancers, just I'm saying that usually on YouTube you can watch either tango class demos or you can see performances from festivals or different uh, workshop weekends, for example. And so basically for us, like we can also see how other people dance, so not so much socially, but as a performer, right? So because I don't think there were at that time when we started uh, a lot of videos from Milongas actually, right? So, yeah. Yes, that's right. There were not so many. I don't, I don't remember being so on, on Facebook or so on on YouTube. It's just in the past five years it it went yeah. wow, and now we're all on the social media. But at that time, no. And then because yes. of the equipment, because our, maybe it wasn't allowed, and also it was, our, it's just so much easier to record on a phone, right? So when you perform, what do you prefer? You do mostly improvised or you throw in some choreography? So you do mainly choreographies, so. I, uh, I have a couple of very good friends, very good um, dance partners, yes. We always improvise, but obviously we meet in advance. We, um, let's say we have a certain date, we know we have a show, we're going to prepare ourselves because we need time to reconnect. So sometimes I don't see my dance partner for weeks, for months. And so if we know we have an exhibition coming up, we definitely set time aside. We meet at the studio and in advance we start to dance so we can reconnect, we can feel each other we can um, investigate what sequences uh, we we going to use so it's always like kind of mapping uh having um like possibly we're going to do that and possibly we're going to do that maybe some lift maybe some jump if it's a if it's a wow tango show or uh, depending on the audience where we're going to dance right but we never have a solid plan. It's never no. We don't 
choreograph from beginning to end, never. But yes, we pick up the music in advance. Uh, and normally the music is related to what we like at this particular moment, right? Uh, the emotional, the emotional level, how you can relate to the music, and then we we dance out together to for reconnection, to connect, to relate to each other, and then when the um, performance comes, it's purely improvisation. But yes, most likely it will include some of the sequences, some of the steps that are just good for us. Can you tell a couple of words, like in general, yes. what were the most uh, memorable performances for you? Wow, yes. So um, a few years ago, in a, um, a Patricio and Eva organized uh, a show with Sextieta Milonguero. And so uh, me and my dance partner, Pablo, were invited to dance at the show. So it was a very memorable event. And uh, we were preparing for the event, yes. And Patricia gave us the space on the stage to dance two, two songs. And we were very honorable and happy. So They the, really love the people also. I like them as dancers and performers a lot, yeah. Yes. yes. So, and we successfully the Longero with them twice, as they were visiting Seattle twice. And then also, uh, Pablo and I danced with uh, El Cachevache, Quinteto. Mm -hmm. They were in Seattle once, and we've danced one, uh, which is more like in a Tango Nuevo style. It's called Transylvanica, the, 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 the song, the piece that kind of, when I listened to that, I was really like, it's something Russian, some Russian, I, I can relate it to. <laughs> To my home country and so we, we chose that piece of the music and it was also very very different very different um experience because it was more for contemporary something mix of time was it the one with the gonna... christina was it the one where you were wearing this kind of zookish uh, le le uh, leggings or was yeah because i really love this we have to for a second uh, explain here that uh, I do Zook also socially, just like as an amateur dancer. And Christina, Christina's part, dance partner, Pablo, is actually a really good Zook dancer. And so, and I, when I was watching it, I thought like, are they gonna throw in some Zook moves or not? And I liked how it had this out of tango feel, but at the same time, was an interesting tango demo in general, right? So I think it was uh, like an open-minded experience. For, for a viewer, yes, I mean, I was yes. watching, I really enjoyed seeing you there, so. Yes, yes, and for me it was very <laughs> a unique experience because I would never ever wear what I was wearing at that time for that particular piece, and Pablo actually, Pablo suggested, and I know that it's coming from Zook, and, and it's like, okay, well, if you think that you it's really... That, so it all worked well. <laughs> <laughs> It's a bit of a refresher for tango dancers because we're still more to a bit more of a, I would say, yeah. I don't know, elegant or, or like conservative look sometimes. Yes, <laughs> yes, exactly. That was, um, but I have a very nice pictures of that as well. So it's oh, like, really wow, great. that yeah. was very nice. Yeah. There was also another performance I saw on um, YouTube. Uh, you, I can't remember whether it was a skirt, red skirt or red top. I also liked music there. It was very moving. A moving piece to watch yeah for, for those who are watching yeah. i just want to say that we will put links in the description so you can also go and check out some things which we are talking about so you'll you'll have your own impression so yeah yes and now i remember as you mentioned the red top now i remember yes it was red top and red skirt it was an alternative piece it was actually walls so um spring i think it's called spring walls and we danced as an alternative tango as well but that was for tango event that michelle badion organizes every year she has a student showcase that's another wonderful teacher and organizer in seattle so from your experience what's the secret of a good partnership on on an exhibition on demo because i know like 
it's not an easy experience. Some people think it's easy to just go, you just go and dance, you know, but in fact, uh, first of all, it requires often a lot of preparation, right? Um, and also coming to some kind of compromise sometimes maybe. Did you have that experience or it just was organically happening for you guys with whoever you perform? Yes. So typically it happens very organically for me because I don't push anyone to do anything. So I... I have an invitation to perform someplace and then I ask either my current dance partner or just mm, dance partners that I know I can dance to, to join me for the project. And if they agree, then we start to work together because you can't make mm, anybody to do anything against its will, right? But once the person wants, the same as you want to perform and to work on that project, everything is possible. And so even if there are some disagreements, normally you come pretty easy to agreement. And so and you just work for the piece of art, you just work for, for the dance itself. So for time. So what was the most challenging part of the performing experience in general in your life? And what was the most rewarding for you? The most challenging experience? I meant in general, like in performing. Mm -hmm. So let's say if someone is considering performing and what would you say for you was something you had to learn about maybe or... To... At the very beginning, when I just started performing, I need to learn how to calm down myself mm -hmm. because I, I had my knees were shaken. So I was so nervous to go and dance and um, so all the people look at you and they judge you or not judge you. So it was more of the work for myself, for my men mental work to, to calm down the body so the body functions well and it does what it needs to do in this moment to dance, right? It's how you can dance when your knees are shaken. You're just not capable. That was the most... The, the the most challenge that I had to overcome, but I overcame it pretty fast. And since that, nothing. It's just good preparation, uh, good preparation, and then solid mind. When you step out on the dance floor to perform, you I I know I I forget everything else that is not related to what I'm doing right now, and you flow. So you flow in that moment with your partner. And if something happens, some minor mistakes or something in the dance, and we had it, and there are some so funny, even with uh, Sextieto Milangero, I remember we had some mistakes, some failures, but what, what can you do? So you still can continue to dance. And, and so... So what did it help you to overcome that uh, kind of performance anxiety at first? It goes away with practice. So the more you perform, the less you, the less you worry about it. You, you, just, you just put yourself in that situation, you perform, you go out, and, and it goes away very organically, very naturally. It's just by doing it, by doing it. Yes. Yeah. And what did you like most in performing? Do you in general enjoy performing? I enjoy. I enjoy the preparation. I enjoy... Um, yes, everything that comes from the preparation stage to the end. So, because it gives me uh, like uplifting feelings, it just gives me so much adrenaline, and I love, I love, I love how I feel when I when I perform and when I prepare for performances. Yeah, that's great. Uh thank you for telling us so i have a question also are you addicted to tango in general like how how is the situation now and whether you were at some point mm -hmm. i was at some point at the beginning we all find ourselves in that like tango becomes your life and all your closet disappears and then you only have tango clothes or you go shopping and then you buy only something that will definitely fit you to go to milonga maybe not so much for other stuff yeah so if that is a dress it's, i'm buying it only if i can wear it for tango and then in my normal life so that makes me want to ask how many dresses you have and how many shoes <laughs> i'm you know i'm I'm proudly can tell not so many. 
being a professional dancer and a teacher, I, I possess only three pair of dance shoes. Oh one to oh, teach, wow. another one to perform, and another one going to Milongas. And once they get destroyed, I buy new ones, but I never ever had 10 pairs or something. Maximum, I had five pairs of dance shoes. That is shoes actually amazing time. because that's very rare, I have to confirm, because yeah. uh, usually, Sometimes it happens because you just have to try if you choose to figure out which one would fit, right? But Yes, I figured that out. I was very, um, for the models that I wear, I'm very, um, I'm very consistent. So I know what fits me. I'm not trying anything. I tried once in a while. It doesn't work. And I know exactly what brand of tango shoes I'm wearing. And so I stick with that. So when you travel, you, it, you're probably faster to pack, right? <laughs> I have no doubts. I have no choices. It's like what pair? Or I have only <laughs> two pairs. And normally I chose one. For tango dresses, it's the same. I have some professional uh, tango dresses to perform on the stage. I have dresses to perform at the restaurant because um, with my another wonderful dance partner, Vladimir, we are dancing currently dancing at the Buenos Aires Grill restaurant every Saturday in Seattle. And so um, this is my weekly job. And I have to have a couple of dresses, so I change them because we have uh, customers uh, who come to have a dinner and to watch us dancing. They just love us dancing. And I can't I be always in the same dress, so I need to change it. And I have a couple of dresses to change for that. And then obviously for my teaching, I have normal clothes that you would go to gym probably. And then for me longest, yeah. I have a couple of dresses. Yeah. As far as restaurant mm -hmm. goes, actually, I had that, you remember maybe Vladimir yeah. asked me once to perform with you and that yes, was not I easy because, it. yeah, like, thank you. That was an interesting experience, very new to me as well. So we didn't have any time to prepare, but what, what I want yeah. to ask you for people, what I want to ask you also just to help people who also are facing a performance in a very unusual space, just for those who don't know, like that restaurant pretty much has like maybe like three meters by one meter roughly, right? And then you have, you have like that shape to perform, right? Which you cannot do as much in terms of like fancier moves, right? So how did you guys solve that situation usually? Yes, that, that unusual, so, not rectangular shape, but more of a corridor type. Yes, that, that is a very interesting space, the restaurant to perform. It has a, um, a little bit of square shape just by the entrance where most of our dancing happens. But we also navigate in between the tables where we just mostly walk and oppose and do some lifts. Oh, um, wow. <laughs> and Right, we, we also do leaves and we fly around, so um, obviously those are something that we prepare in advance, so we practice, but Vladimir is very good at navigating the space, he knows it so well, and so we never hit somebody, we never hit tables, and we don't fall, and, no, and that gives us an incredible experience. It just the proof of it was last year when we were invited to perform with the symphony orchestra in Bremerton. It's north of Seattle on the islands. So, and it was a huge symphony in the theater. You can imagine like 40, 50 people of musicians. We have a bandoneon, uh, Mirta from Seattle, and we have uh, the, the guitar player from Buenos Aires. So it was a mix of classical music with the tango also and Vladimir and I were performing for tango and we were left just about this much yeah, of the yeah. space and you're either going to hit musicians or you're going to fail all of the stage yeah <laughs> it's actually very familiar in Moscow yeah I've had also this experience over very so and we were at that we were so grateful that we have experience of dancing in the restaurant in between the tables because he exactly the moment where we can we can use that that um, experience to navigate and dance and not to fall either way and, and still perform good. It was also unforgettable, very, very wonderful performance just last year. Did you try 
try to ask musicians to push back a little bit? <laughs> we try it a little bit, but we say, well, there are so many of us, we can't, they pushed a little bit bandonian and the guitar, but then the, you have all the chords they, that come to the speakers, to the monitors, and so it's a equipment plus <laughs> people, <laughs> so. Yeah. So what's your, what's your um, take from that? Like, what was your lesson? Like, what's best on, in those circumstances? In those circumstances, the lesson is that if you want to be a performer, you have to perform. You need to take any opportunity. It, uh, sometimes it's paid, sometimes it's not paid. Yes, but if you want to perform, you need to get the experience in performing. It's, di it's very difficult to just jump out and say, well, I'm going to perform and then perform and expect it to be good. No, you have to come from the through the learning curve to... to be comfortable in what you are doing and have faith in in yourself and because situations happens and uh sometimes the dress can move whatever whatever situations can happen and sometimes you don't feel well your partner doesn't feel well you lose balance you lose that that but um, yeah. still it needs to be overall people people who watch you the audience should not notice anything that is happening it needs to be presentable it needs to be professional and for that you need to have an experience mirroring like from what you're saying is that you cannot expect every performance to be perfect right so you just say the more you do yeah, you the more you're familiar with yes, the, uh, absolutely yeah not uh, a, not every performance is the same you always have something uh positive negative you always have situations and yeah. But that's what makes it memorable, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In terms of stage, I think like for, again, like I'm not, for example, like I don't position myself as a, position, as a professional performer, even though I do some demos whenever there is an opportunity. But in Moscow, ironically, I also was invited once to um, a hall in, a sim in similar circumstances and then they couldn't, couldn't push far. So what we realized also is that you have to dress uh, not in black, right? Because if musicians are dressed in black, mm -hmm and you have like black pants or both like black suit then you just will not be even visible right because everything a lot happens in terms of legs right what we do right so uh it's just like my small take right. like um, in terms of how did you guys were you dressed more brightly or we were dressed um i still use my black uh professional black tango dress with slits and open back so there was mm, body that you see which is mm, which is uh, always light. nice <laughs> yes uh, always nice and then i had a pink colored dress but i don't know how it's in moscow now at uh, at that uh, time 16 years ago but in the states you have very good light light technicians yes whenever you're on the stage even if all musicians are black they work out with the lights they always put yes. the, the spotlight on the dancers they ask you what what light like pink blue you want to have oh, okay, see, yeah. so no it, it's not a problem uh when it's done professionally on the stage they take care of you so you are visible you don't need to know like uh, worry so much about what you are wearing what you are wearing is absolutely needs to be for tango, right? It needs to be if we dance Argentine tango, we we dress with just tango. Yeah. Yeah, in that hall they had more it was Tchaikovsky Hall, you know, it's yeah, more probably. over mm -hmm. like flood light, I would say, like just an even light, but it yes. was, was a right, really, even really light, yellowish, yes, not yeah. so much of the mm-hmm. Yeah, yes, so there, when, there was no an opportunity. But it's great, like the more actually you talk to other performers, probably you can sort of see what what they're doing or even just by watching right at times so. yes exactly yeah nice okay so so now let's talk a bit about your project which you had uh with uh, your friend uh with the studio that you created like tell us about how it was and where you are now with it so in general yes so it was a wonderful project six years ago uh, my partner Natasha and I, we have joined our forces, let's say, and we opened a dance studio in Bellevue for, um, that offers all variety of dance classes for kids, youth and adults. And obviously Argentine Tango was part of it. And um, I used to be a business partner in that project, but then a few years ago, I left 
right? And I stayed with the studio as being Argentine tango teacher only. And um, but the studio has grown a lot since that time. Uh, Natasha puts a lot of energy, lots of work to promote the studio, to grow, and it goes really, really, really well. Uh, and, and she has dance show productions every year. So it's interesting. You may look it up. That was actually right? amazing. You know, Christina, I just want to say that I think it was maybe even just one or two years after you guys started. And by chance, either just on YouTube or through your Facebook, I saw that video with the performance and actually you were dancing some kind of was it swing or something like that i was really impressed with that other song it was oh. it was interesting yeah. like it was such a high level like because i know i've been to my niece's performances a lot what people do like that was really a good level of uh, performances over there i was impressed what you guys did and i can imagine it takes a ton of work to yeah to so yeah normally kids start to prepare for for the show from like September, so it takes the whole year, and then the show is produced in May. And yes, all our teachers in the studio are very highly professional. They have experience in dancing and teaching and putting choreographies together. And um, Natasha rents out the Petra with lights, with music professional, yes. And so normally it's a, it's a good, amazing quality of the dance production that has a always has a story beyond it so it's a, it's a show in a, that has a storyline toward that yeah. and every piece yeah part of it and i remember we also had a, and still have the latest uh, latest performance team that i used to be part of and that's where all this funny uh, other type of dances like jive paso doble i remember yes well the cha cha were coming out yeah, so maybe different... it was cha i can't remember I, i'm gonna link this video in the description i really liked it yeah it yes fun. yes that was also part i was part of the team and we danced and not only for La Vida, we performed at other events. Uh, I put that jive dance with all the polka dot dresses, green. Oh, that was, that was uh, it. Yeah, that was jive. Yes. It was, it was amazing, yes. I, I also incorporated that piece in Seattle Tango Magic Festival that me and Anton used oh, to really? organize. Oh, okay. it, was like, yes, it was part of the festival and we put it as a surprise during the Grand Ball Milonga and even the um, maestros, Argentinian maestros were like, wow, what's that? It was, that was it really was fun. So which year was it? I wasn't probably at that edition. Uh, yes, it was, I think, I believe 2016. Maybe, yeah. I've been once in the last years, yeah. Yes, last year definitely no. The previous, no, it has 2016. Mm -hmm. That's nice. Let's say, so you learned those dances in the studio or you, you already were doing in parallel some other dances? Because I had no idea you were doing other dances. Yeah, so we were learning it in the dance studio. Yes. So we had a wonderful choreographer at that time. Um, now uh, the, the instructor's team has changed. Uh, and our choreographer, Anna, so she, uh, Anna, and after that, Natalia, Natalia uh, Zrajeste. So they would work a specific piece of the choreography for a certain music that normally has a base of something that a uh, jive, which is from ballroom program, or cha cha from the ballroom, or samba. Uh, but they would never make it as a um, traditional, traditional jive or traditional, traditional cha cha variation, but put it more in a contemporary, contemporary, um, contemporary steps, movements, so that everybody can understand and learn it. So the, there were girls in our group that had no dance experience whatsoever, ever. So no dance experience, zero. And they would grow just by practicing, practicing, and practicing into, into that. So, so basically that means that when people were joining your groups, like in your studio, they already knew like there will be a performance after, right? Am I right to understand? Yes, or? yes, yes. There always, definitely, there's always, the studio produces once a year show, 
that's a definite. So whoever joins and becomes part of the performance team, they have the space where they're going to perform. After that, the choreographer it, um, by itself looks for other opportunities. So uh, in case of Natalia Zrajewska, she has known lots of um, uh, people, other communities where she would take our group, our team, and we would perform at other locations for different events. The same oh. I do for Argentine Tango. Mm -hmm. I'm asking also partially in terms of uh, producing, organizing point of view, right? So, for example, when you start a studio, I assume that you're still competing with some other studios, right? And then right. what helped you guys actually to uh, have those like people who would stay with you for the whole year rather than just one short series or one class event? So what was your policy strategy in terms of uh, how to attract uh, your like more followers of the school and students long term? Right. So for for the kids and youth, it's it's a little bit easy because normally once the school year starts in yes in parents are looking for opportunities what else they can find for like after school program right and normally we ha like in the united states we know that everything goes schedules like you have schedule for that you people are very busy they have they it's like busy life and uh, they need to organize they need to know what they do at what time and so for kids it's like parents they set up their kids for entire school year mm -hmm. to participate in a dance studio that's that's how it is pretty much the same like in russia for adults it's a little bit tricky because adults have choice of um, going to many events and once the winter comes they like to go skiing and so yes yeah, skiing is, is another <laughs> <laughs> so there are like other activities in the fear <laughs> yes um, Maybe they want to go to Buenos Aires as well. Maybe right? they want to go to Buenos Aires if they don't ski, or if they do, they also have uh, so, yeah, summer time there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, yeah, I see it's kind of similar probably how, um, like for example, my niece again, like they have a dance school here, so it's so you had like a similar policy, I assume, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, pretty much all studios have same policies because you don't invent something new it's just something that's proved to work and then natasha takes time to investigate and look for things and natasha is amazing yeah i really love her and she she's just not only a great dancer but she proved to be yeah. really a fantastic organizer as well as yes that's true. So, a few rooms right as far as i remember was it two rooms or was it you have two rooms yes and then a, a very small room that was originally planned to be like uh, for um, to babysit and then but then we um, left this idea and we transitioned that room for private to, for private um, space to teach private lessons yeah and then we moved out from Bellevue location uh, I think it was already two years ago or, or a year ago I don't remember right and uh, we changed location. Now we have three rooms oh. of a pretty good size. Um, two rooms are the same size, and one room is a little bit smaller, and a private room, which is smaller. So basically, we have four rooms mm -hmm. right now. Yes. So what are your uh, main uh, three tips for someone who wants to have a school, like uh, not necessarily maybe d Argentine tango school, but in general dance school, since it's your experience, you kind of had both experiences, right? Like just sm a small school and then, yeah. Yes. And a bigger one, yes. right? So. Yes. Yes. Uh, well, first of all, you need to understand that uh, to have a school, it's a commitment so you need to answer a question for yourself why do you want to have a school and then am i available to commit myself like full time without vacations right mm -hmm. so because uh, to grow something to grow the studio you need to have time uh, for for it to grow organically and so it's not going to happen overnight it's not going to happen like in a month 
so y you really need to commit yourself and say like, yes, I'm staying in this city, I'm staying in this neighborhood, and I'm committing myself for five years, for, I don't know, 10 years, for for extended period of time, and I'm doing it. So if that's yes, then yes, you just, you just you you open then you need to have like organizational skills a little bit of business skills and, um, you ask professionals um, but then it goes but first the initial is that why you are doing it and are you ready can you commit yourself and are you sure because it's not that easy you can't just then give up uh, you know and you, yeah. for benefits to come from your work there is a you have to wait yes you have to wait meaning it's just not going to happen overnight so yeah, yeah. You know, i guess it's, it's really it's totally true like in general especially yeah. since in north america um, whoever doesn't live here like people it's quite common to move from one city to another like not as much as in most as in russia for example right so just because it's easier to do that in some way within your country, especially, right? So yes, yes, yeah. Okay, all right. So yeah. um, now, 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 let's talk about Tango Magic. Sorry, yes. just one second, because <laughs> I have Magic Tango, so I confuse, right? <laughs> okay. So now let's talk about the festival which you took over from the another organizer. Tell us about your experience. The, the name of it is Seattle Tango Magic Festival. That was in Seattle for 15 years and the previous organizer Arthur Newman was organizing it for like about 10 years yes and then um, he decided that okay that's enough I'm tired of it I better to pass it over and so and Anton and I were lucky to to inherit the festival and to continue it for another five years and um, it was great it took all um, it was happening in the middle of the summer and we all know that summers are in seattle are the best time to visit and so plenty of sunshine and you have lakes and mountains and just very pleasant city to be around this time of the year and um yeah, for, for were, you, were you with Anton uh, as a couple at that time, or you already guys were uh, like on your separate journeys? So how was it? At that time, it was both. So um, Anton, we were as a couple, so we were married at that time when we took over the festival. Yes, and we for three years we we were still as a couple and. Well, we were a family and we were, at some point we were dance partners and also we did, we were, at um, some times we were teaching together at the studio. And then there were another two, two years of Tango Magic when we already um, separated with Anton and finally, and finally separated. So, and we continued to work together at the festival. So festival, Seattle Tango Magic Festival was always produced and supported and managed and and during the festival it was always two of us, Anton and I. It yeah. never was just me. Or, yes, so we always it's, were working together. It's actually um, what I was impressed also, like uh, knowing you both a little bit, right? So in terms of and knowing also how much it takes to organize a festival that is really like a lot of work like that you were doing at the same time the studio growing it from zero right so and at the same time also you were working on the festival uh, did you manage okay all this uh, together or like uh, is there something yeah. you would do differently maybe or so um i knew how much energy it takes to, to to organize festival and i can tell you that the preparation for the festival starts half a year in advance of the actual days of the festival As some planning like um, keeping in mind who what maestros we want to work like all of that is happening even before but the the real real job full-time like daily job 
prepare, preparation, advertisement, um, um, in, including the volunteers, assigning the tasks for them, all of that happens six months in advance. And then during the festival that in our case, it was five days long, you just nonstop, it's um, 24 hours, you, you, you go and run. And so with my job in, in a studio, during the festival, I always was taking a break from the studio. I always say like, okay, for this week, once the festival is starting, I'm not in the studio. I'm not, I'm not teaching. I'm just, I'm not, I'm not present because no, you can't do, you can't do both. Same with Anton with, with his full-time job. He would take days off. Otherwise you just go crazy. You don't sleep at night and, and then, uh, and then you wake up and you have to run to to take care of the classes that run through the festival, open doors and um, watch out for volunteers and all of that. It's just nonstop, but I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. Yes, yeah, it was a really beautiful <laughs> event. Like I've been, I think, to one or two when you guys are doing it and I really was impressed with the level and, and also how how relaxed you were actually i did oh i do remember you because you were doing this performance of jive at, on stage right like not in this center. okay okay so i was there nice I, yeah, it's true like uh because i thought like how did she manage to change the dress so fast because <laughs> I, <saw, laughs> I saw you announcing something before and after i think it was yeah my compliments because we all love that festival so I just don't travel as much right now, but usually there is a crowd of people from Vancouver who go there. Is it still on? Are you still part of it or you are not no, anymore? Yeah. No. Yes, he, let's make it clear. So the last Seattle Tango Magic was in 2018, in September 2018. And um, after that, we made, Anton and I, we made a decision to stop it yeah. for a yeah. while or maybe forever, we don't know, I don't know. Yep. But since 2018, Seattle Tango Magic Festival is not happening. And uh, there is another festival that is now in Seattle, but is not part of Seattle Tango Magic Festival, and we are not part of the organi organizing it. Also, so, throughout these last years, kind of what, there was a boom for encuentros and marathons and everything. So. Uh, I don't know about you, but in Vancouver, like no one is doing a festival now. And it's really difficult. To, it was difficult for people to do it in a row, a few festivals in a row, because it's just really a, a big risk of even losing money. And so I hope you guys were doing okay. Yeah, but uh, yeah. just for everyone who is watching and attending festivals, I think it's really important that the, the organizers actually get some revenue for themselves because yeah. it's just the amount of work is insane. And it's just you you are in a healthier state if you are not worrying as much about yes. um, some the certain details because logistics is just part of it, but it's important that it's a, a solid project, right? So yes. you see some other people also kind of wrapping up their events and it does seem like nowadays like either people come just for dancing or they come to learn, which is more of a workshop weekend or a camp maybe, right? So something like that. Yeah. So yeah, it's a challenge and it's a challenge and too. With all the encuentros, marathons, you know, sometimes it, it now festivals, maybe in Europe is different, but I have a feel that the festivals go, they just yeah. start to disappear because we can't just have what we need to have in terms of the revenue yes to cover all the expenses that festival has a huge is to rent out all the venues in seattle in the summer it's insane it's very expensive then to invite guest teachers that fly overseas and then yeah even though seattle yeah. has an advantage uh compared to vancouver in terms of flights and everything right and it can attract people by car right but you still guys are still a bit far away from many teachers base right exactly so, yes yeah. yes yeah. That to invite uh, teachers, Argentinians that either flying from Buenos Aires or from Europe to Seattle is um yeah. Is well, there was always a great choice of teachers, as far as I I saw in myself and also I knew at your festival, and also you invited some musicians. Like I remember Grisha was performing, right, and some other musicians, or, and also 
that salmon bake is such a gem, right? The, yes. I hear. Like even the floor is a little bit <laughs> difficult, but it's just like we were lucky. Like when I was there, like the weather was always like fantastic, even if there were some rainy days before. Right. Right? So yeah. it's like a magical part of the festival, right? So. Yes, yes. Salmon bake is what people remember the most from the festival. Yes. So to have the barbecued summer on the open air milonga, looking on the over the lake and then the sunset goes and then it's all beautiful sky wonderful yeah. food also yes. wonderful food yes nice okay so well thank you also guys for coming to some of vancouver events for djing yes you yes, and don were, were part of that yeah i appreciate workshops yes yeah i appreciate the collaboration so all right so we have a couple of more questions uh, in terms of for uh, in general, like dancing as a social part of life, right? So when you started dancing, did you try to convert your relatives or friends?